Dad and I were told a story of grand heroism in which potentially many lives were saved by the brave acts of one individual. When I heard this story, it was sensational to me and it characterized what it meant to be a hero in this way with grand acts, actions, and brave acts. It was my dad who pointed out the misfortune of disregarding those who give so much of themselves as being anything less than the greatest of heroes, who redefined my concept of what it means to be a hero generosity, kindness, caring and self-sacrifice. With this altered interpretation, I can think of no one who would argue that my granny June Fortis was anything less than a hero. I spent a lot of time attempting to recall specific memories that I had with my granny, but my mind has never really worked like that. Rather than discrete events, my thoughts become more like a bold stroke of abstractions with significant meaning in them, for me, which form a beautiful picture. When I look back on my relationship with my granny, I remember the ease in which I could talk with her, the fact that she had a good sense of humor. I recall her getting me Rolos as a treat and letting me decorate sugar cookies quite poorly at Christmas. <laughs> I remember having a wonderful time with her at Falcon Lake and her taking me to the water and patiently watching me swim for hours and hours and hours until my lips turned blue and she made me get out of <laughs> She was the best person to text somebody in the bed at night, swinging her arms widely around her and then sort of pushing the blankets in and around you so that you were in a sleep security cocoon designed specifically for you. More generally, I remember her as being patient and genuinely interested in the people around her. She was lighthearted and spirited. She was modest and never seemed to require praise for what was obviously her never-ending efforts to make every day comfortable and enjoyable for her family. She was doting and inclusive, and even while she was firm, which was rare, there was a gentleness about it, which I appreciate more in that toughness as an adult than I ever could as a child for its impact. I am grateful for her. <coughs> Later in life, when my began, granny first began losing her faculties, she retained those qualities which I believe to be irrefutably part of her essence. I am a person who always attempts to find a purpose in experiences in life, particularly in the challenges. I struggle still with understanding the purpose of the disease that seemed to slowly consume her. My granny was a linchpin and she brought all of us together as a family. <coughs> Maybe part of that purpose was to give the rest of us opportunity to become closer and rely on the support we could offer one another as a family, particularly with that of my dad and my uncle. Her sickness and her death were a loss to all of us who had the fortune of being in her presence but it has been part of my grieving process to consider both the celebration of her life and also the freedom of her passing. There is a passage that is echoed in me, which I read in the beginning of a novel. Death is, among other things, also a wild celebration of renewal with our substance hosting the party. I cannot think of a more wonderful sentiment for granted. She is so entirely unencumbered and limitless. She is in all things and everywhere. Her energy is not gone. It is transformed and less orderly. A popular Serbian proverb reminds us, be humble for you are made of earth. Be noble for you are made of stars. 
Thank God for that. I can hope for nothing more beautiful than that, nor a greater gift to Granny or all of us who continue to breathe her in and take her. Uh, all right, so I'm the eldest of Jean's, or my granny's, two granddaughters. <coughs> Veronica made me a little teary, and I'm probably going to get more teary, so <coughs> bear with me. My granny was such a beautiful person. She was so very loving, kind, and generous. She could be especially silly, too. I remember the times we played Scrabble together and went swimming together at Tony at a beach at Falcon Lake. And the many times she expressed her loving concern for my health and vegan diet by taking it upon herself to buy me omega oil blends and vitamins. <laughs> Granny would always try to comfort friends and family with food. Some of the foods that I will always think of when I think of my Granny would be pierogies and Scottish shortbread both of which were usually enjoyed on Christmas Day. I have many fond memories of my granny, but one of my earliest and most vivid memories that I seem to recall is from when I was still very young. I honestly can't recall how young, but I remember I was young enough to still be picked up and held with some relative amount of ease. So when I was this age and before my granny had retired, I recall she often wore a silver chain necklace with a particular pendant, which I absolutely adored. The pendant was a crystal cube, and one of the corners of the cube was mirrored and sliced off. And this allowed for it to more comfortably rest on one's chest, but it also allowed for the light to be captured, reflected, and refracted in the most beautiful ways. I thought it was the most beautiful thing in the world, and I always wanted to touch it and look at it and, and hold it, moving it slightly to reflect and refract tiny miniature rainbows of delightful wonder. I have this specific memory where, upon noticing Granny was wearing this necklace, I became so excited to touch it and hold it again. Awed by its beauty and light, I asked her if I could have it. I was little. <laughs> she replied something to the effect of no, because it was hers and she was quite fond of it herself. So innocently, I asked if I could have the necklace after she died. <laughs> Being a child and relatively innocent at the time, I did not realize this was such a social faux pas. My granny and dad laughed pretty heartily over my question, and of course proceeded to tell me that it was rather impolite to ask such things. I suppose the reason is generally considered rather impolite to remind each other and ourselves of our own mortality. It's because it is almost akin to pointing out and bringing to light our most greatest fundamental flaw that no matter how good we may be, no matter how happy we may be, no matter how much we may love or work or succeed or fail or try, and no matter how brightly we may sparkle and shine, one day each of us shall come to pass. Nothing is permanent. Even the sun will one day, in a very long time from now, come to pass. But nothing will truly cease to exist, not really. It's a scientific law that all matter and energy is constant. It cannot be created nor destroyed, but rather change forms in a constant, eternal, cosmological cycle of life. We were born of light, and to the light we will eventually return. Embrace the lightness of each of your days. Embrace love. Embrace all the colors of the rainbow. For now, this moment is all we truly ever have. The present is just that, a present, a gift. Please don't take it for granted. And I'm truly glad to have been given such an extraordinarily beautiful gift in that of my grandmother, Jean Rose Fordyce. I love you, Granny. And I always will. The divine light in me House to the divine light of you. Namaste. And uh, Abby, uh, if you don't mind, I might just sing that song you made up. Well, Bachan might sing it unless you, you want to try. 
<laughs> I can make this microphone go. You can do it for Granny. Do you want me to help you get started? I noticed you came up to the front. That's good. So, when Abby was a little girl, her mother used to sing her this song, and, and, and she was recalling, she was recalling that to me in the kitchen, and the song is called Hey Jude. I'll just hum a bit, might, might get her in the mood. <laughs> so it would go something like this. Hey June, don't be afraid. Take a sad song and make it better. Remember to let her into your heart. Then you can start to make it better, 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 better. No. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Hey, June. Okay, so. <laughs> Thank you for coming up. Uh, look, look what I made you. I made you this beautiful ribbon. Are you, are you going to join us for the next song? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Here, just hold it. If you get in the mood, you're welcome to join us. So, let's see, where was I? I got up and wrote this this morning. I had a mental block until then. <clears throat> Sensei Alric has often reminded us that each year that we live on our home, planet Earth, it is one journey around the sun. June has made that journey around the sun 80 revolutions. Metaphorically speaking, perhaps, after the years we lost June to Alzheimer's, we can now feel her consciousness bud forth like the lotus flower, and we can feel her brightness once again. Here it comes. Make a big 
sun, 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 here it comes. Sun, 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 here it comes. Do for Granny! <laughs> sun, 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 here it comes. that uh, Veronica made in high school. <laughs> <laughs> I just have a few more words and I'd like to address the subject of the girls club. Well, as Buddhist, Buddhist sensei encourages, his, uh, encourages us to vow to mature into peace bringers and life bringers. On my own journey, I am realizing the sacred nature of woman is to be life giver, nurturer, steward, and protector. Life is sacred. One aspect of June's life, which I find especially joyful, is her girls club. Five years ago, six members of the Girls Club, June Fordyce, Helen Olenek, Marion Morrison, Addie Jason, Don Comstock, and the late Helen Walker, gathered to reminisce and celebrate June's 75th birthday. The core of the Girls Club began in the late 50s. North End girls who wanted to stay in touch after high school. In its various incarnations, the girls met month after month, year after year, taking turns hosting late dinners for each other in the early years after the kids had gone to bed. Together, the girls witnessed and shared the common experiences of their lives. Many were each other's bridesmaids. Sophie, June's mother, was a fine seamstress and made many of their dresses. The girls laughed as they remembered how it was okay to wear their bridesmaids' dresses over and over again. Eventually, they would see each other at baby showers and anniversaries, and as life would have it, at funerals. Helen Olenek lived for the girls' club she looked forward to Girls Club like it was a dance or a wedding. If the kids were sick, she would find someone to look after them. The Girls Club was Helen's priority. Nancy commented that none of them would, had ever been to a psychiatrist. Nancy made the full course dinner with turkey, meatballs, and halapshi. And Marion Morrison even had Santa Claus for the Girls Club. Sonia observes, however, that they are all different people with different interests. It occurred to Don Comstock, they all seem to be Slavic. Ukrainian, Polish, and Ruskies. Addie recognized that they were all the same age and shared common experiences. The cohesiveness, cohesiveness of the group developed over years, and the girls club created a root a comfort level for them all. Helen Walker remembered June as a good friend and the one who sold her beautiful perfumes from Beauty Counselor. Dawn affirms June's considerate nature, particularly noticed as they traveled together to destinations such as Venezuela. 
Sonia remembers Junie, never able to sit still, always bringing things or clearing the table. Helen Olenek gives the girls club credit for really bringing Junie out of her shell. I would like to gift an apron to the women of the girls club. And along the hem are signatures gathered on that jo joyful day of June's 75th birthday. And uh, I, Helen Olenek is here and Addie, Jason is here. I'm just going to give you the whole package. And at that time, uh, Rob videotaped uh, our conversation and Veronica uh, fielded the questions and little Abby was there and, uh, as a baby and, and our dog Mickey was there too, five years ago. So thank you very much. <laughs> David, June's oldest son, <coughs> and uh, I guess I'd like to thank everyone uh, just for coming out today. It's such a cold, cold winter day, but uh, we're here to celebrate Mom's life and honor her and remember her. So, um, I'm sure, like everyone here, I have fond memories of my mother. My mother's maternal instinct to provide love and nourish her children and family as well as provide support and friendship to those that were lucky enough to know her as a friend. Always giving, providing, never asking for anything in return. Uh, June was an awesome mother and friend. wanted me to go last and I wanted Dave to go last so I guess Dave's gonna go last. <laughs> <laughs> Our mother passed away on December 26 at 9 12 in the evening. When she died it was just like breathing out a very subtle difference that will reverberate in me for a long time. Mum had an expression that she often used to use. That was really different. I would ask her what she thought of a movie or a book that she had read, and she would say, it was really different. The same thing could be applied to a meal Dave prepared, one of Rochelle's plays, a song that Joan and Jerry sang, a poem by Veronica, or a video by myself or Ryan. It always sounded like a compliment, like something positive. At least she smiled when she said it. <laughs> I believe she liked different. Which brings us to this service. Mom was not a Buddhist, but when we decided to have a service, the only person Dave and I both thought of was Sensei Ulrich. Sensei retired recently, so we are grateful that he was willing to do this for us. We would also like to acknowledge Sensei Michael, the new minister, for allowing us to use the temple and for being so supportive. It was important for us to conduct this ceremony in a spiritual place somewhere where we had connections to, a place familiar to our mother, June. June was not affiliated with any church and hadn't been for many years, but she believed in God, and this is a comfortable place for many beliefs. As most of you know, June's health had deteriorated over the past five years and she struggled with dementia. Her memory became confused and her cognitive abilities were impaired. There were heart-wrenching moments and difficult periods. But what came through, overwhelmingly, was June's resiliency. Her desire to take what life had to offer and be positive. Later, when June became bedridden, it was a little harder. 
Mom was a hardworking person who cared deeply about others. At various points in her life, she took care of her mother, mother-in-law, husband, her sons, and helped with her granddaughters. Mom was an avid reader who shared her appreciation of reading by taking me to the library for story time. She was a wonderful cook who enjoyed good food. She loved to travel. Some of you here today have friendships with June that dates back, what, 70 years? Back to the house on Burroughs Avenue where June lived with her parents, Andrew and Sophie Savinsky. Both Andrew and Sophie came from large families and they decided that June would be their only child so that they could suitably provide for her. She was a pretty shy little girl. She told me as a child she had been hit by a bicycle and as a result it developed a stuttering problem. She re related with pride how she had taught herself not to stutter and had overcome her shyness by giving herself a good talking to. She was quite proud of that. I know her friends in the quote unquote girls club supported her in this and encouraged her to speak up for herself. Mum would encourage us all, including her granddaughters, Rochelle and Veronica, to stand up and be counted. Everyone's memory works differently and our memories can play tricks on us. Age can play a role in that. There is a seven year age difference between David and myself. Naturally, we have different memories. For instance, there was an evergreen tree in the front yard of our house on Government Avenue. I had brought the tree home and gave it to mum. And yet curiously, mistakenly, Dave seems to believe that he brought the tree home. <laughs> now the tree is gone. I remember Dave sitting on my chest in our basement, out of earshot of our parents, tickling me relentlessly. I also remember Dave and I working together to help our mom and help each other through these last few years. I would like to share a few more of my memories about our mother, June. Laying in bed and being read Jack and the Beanstalk. I remember an ironing board leaning against our Chesterfield. I would lay on the board with my head near the floor. Mum sat beside me, covered my back with a towel, and began thumping me on the chest and back with her hand, causing me to cough up phlegm and spit it into a plastic cup filled with tissues. Not all my memories involve lying down or sound like strange rituals. I remember a road trip with the, J the Dijons. I saw you come in, John. <coughs> John. With the Dijons and the Drysdales. We were camping near Dryden, Ontario. While everyone else was off fishing, we gathered blueberries and Mum somehow baked a delicious blueberry pie on a camp stove. Christmas visits with the Dijons and the Scrapniks. Veronica and her granny baking cookies, just like I remember baking cookies with my mum. Dave, Dad and I teasing Mum about her culinary experiments including a horrible play on words for paella. I remember us playing Ramoli with mum, dad, and our grandparents, Bud and Gertrude. I remember mum's pride attending Rochelle's graduation. Mum's happiness at Joan and mine's wedding, which occurred in this very room. Donna, you didn't have an opportunity to get to know June before her illness. But as I said at your wedding, I am sure that Mum was thrilled that Dave and you found each other and that the two of you will create many happy memories of your own. 
I'm almost done. I would like to share some thoughts from two sources with two different perspectives. The first is from the book of John, chapter 3, verse 8. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. The second is advice from Abby, June's great-granddaughter. You just have to believe that the person who has died is right beside you all the time, just like I do with Mickey. Whatever lets you move forward. I was going to end by saying, Viva la différence. <laughs> but I was advised against it. <laughs> Instead, I will, I will close by saying, Oh, Mum, we love you. I'm happy your suffering has ended. Thanks for taking care of us. You're beautiful. Robert's in much better control of his emotions than I am. So. All the words and thoughts that have already been said today echo my words and thoughts, and we all just say them a little bit differently. So I don't. One page. <laughs> already read half of it. So I'll just say a few words there. My mother was an awesome mother and friend. Gone yet not forgotten, although we are apart, your spirit lives within me. For in my heart, I do have more to say, but uh, I'm going to jump to the end and just say that's all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for everything, Mom. And love you. Thanks. Namo Amida Boda. Namo Amida Boda. Namo Amida Boda. Namo. Which is I so bored.